Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Co-Chair. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I want to join in the acknowledgments of our wonderful hosts. I hope everyone is already enjoying, although I see a few yawns this morning, the wonderful hospitality of the Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet and their relatives here in the Atlantic coast. We uh, so much appreciate the powerful start to our day, being welcomed as we have by Chief Knockwood. And I know all of our executive appreciate our colleague, Regional Chief Roger Augustine, your invitation and welcome with your fellow leaders here in your territories to come to this beautiful region of the country. And while it is that he is wondering where the theme came from, the theme very much came from the Regional Chief. I know, though, that it was very much inspired by the treaties, and I was so happy to receive a document reminding us all about the sanctity of the treaties amongst our peoples. And the history in this part of the country runs very deep. And so the opening thoughts here by the elders who've offered up prayer, the drum that has uh, led the way from El Sibuktuk, the veterans, the reminder as has been offered up, the regional chief, reflecting on the comment as the flags were coming in, being thankful for life, recognizing the role that the veterans have had. And then the ceremony with the Acadian community, a reminder of the deep, the deep history here in this part of the country and the relationships that have been recommitted to here in ceremony with the offering up of the medal, Regional Chief, that you've received from the Acadians. They as well are facing a situation of lost language and great challenge in, in their own communities and they recognize that so too do we and they were sharing with me privately that this is something we must all be in together with the important work before us. To all of the delegates here in particular, the youth leadership that I see before me here with their fans, it is warm. The women leadership, all the special hosts and special guests. It has been a wonderfully warm welcome and into an area that is world renowned in fact for their hospitality. And throughout the activities through the weekend and yesterday, you'll see in your kits there's an update for a number of events that have happened and uh, including the uh, five kilometer run for most of us and uh, one of our chiefs there in fact did over 20 kilometers. Chief Day, uh, he, he committed to that. That's a big effort that was concluded on. This, uh, this is a powerful opportunity that we have to gather under an inspiring theme in the spirit of peace and friendship. This was the vision of our ancestors from within this territory and right across the country. A vision of indigenous nations working together, respecting and supporting one another. When the newcomers arrived, our nations extended the same support, but we did so in the full knowledge of our rights and our responsibilities. Today, it is my great pleasure to reflect on an important year that has passed since we last gathered in Winnipeg, but more importantly, on the year ahead. I believe that there is both tremendous potential and urgent pressure on us all as First Nations leaders to facilitate, support, and create real change in our communities. The First Nations Crown relationship is indeed alive. From pre-Confederation to the numbered treaties, to modern treaties and to the title and rights holders, this relationship 
while it takes different forms and has different histories, is premised on common elements. It begins with our sacred rights and sacred responsibilities, our very identity and our jurisdiction. This relationship frames in a permanent and enduring way our self-determination, our future, and our success. As we gather in this region, we're reminded that the nations that are part of the pre-Confederation era are affirming their place. The Mi'kmaq have made tremendous strides in education, and it started with affirming their role, their language, and their control. Treaty nations throughout the numbered treaty territories are actively engaged in every aspect of their relationships, strengthening their societies, economies, cultures, and governments is all taking place grounded in the original vision of the ancestors as set out in treaty. Through spending time with treaty elders, leaders, and youth, we learn so much together. Ceremony and protocol are the foundation of treaty, and I was honored to join many in the sunrise ceremony this morning on the shores of that beautiful river. In early June, I had the honor of participating in a sacred ceremony in Pongasi First Nation with Elder Dave Kuchain, who I know is here amongst us, along with elders from Treaty 3 and the Treaty 3 drum. The purpose of the ceremony was described to me as invoking the strength of our ancestors to support the challenging work that each and every one of us must do each and every day. Just last week, I was so fortunate again to visit within Treaty 9 territory as I was hosted at the Moose Cree First Nation on the shores of James Bay at a conference of the Meshkegawak Council. Recent research in that territory, in Treaty 9, is confirming for, can for Canadians, for all Canadians, what our elders have always told us. And we pass this message on to our youth. Our people did not surrender our land or our treaty rights. This is a message that all of Canada must hear for this is the foundation of our relationship. The promises that we made must be honored. Our treaty youth are speaking out to carry this message forward. As young Trina Williams challenged us at that meeting, she said we need to make something actually happen. Instead of all this talking, we need to make things happen together as one. Treaty 9 youth leader Carolee Nakochi challenged her peers to speak out and she said, if you have something to say, say it right now. If you want to make change, do it. And I couldn't agree more. We find inspiration everywhere, in the wisdom of our elders and the voices of our youth. They are our future. They're our future right now. I have said many times, and we've heard it over and over again, we are all treaty people. Beyond the number of treaties, Nations have advanced new treaties throughout the country. The James Bay Cree of Quebec, their challenges and struggles and their tremendous success is instructive to us all. We look to the north, to the Yukon, where they have engaged in the hard work of reclaiming their jurisdiction, building their institutions and defining their relationship in the current context. This success has brought new challenges, challenges of maintaining the relationship enforcing implementation because with all treaties the work does not end with the agreement but this is merely the beginning of the relationship we look also to regions in bc and elsewhere title and rights holders advancing a way forward on many different fronts i think of a celebration that i attended amongst the mono people this spring and the moment where they brought forward a canoe which was a symbolic conclusion of generations of effort it was a moment of survival. It was a moment of triumph. I was there when my good friend, Huayat Hereditary Chief, Tom Happynook, he grabs me by the shoulders and he's got, he's got uh, full of emotion and tears in his eyes. And he says, Sean, the moment that this came into effect is the moment that we are free. We're finally free from the Indian Act, is what he said. This was a feeling that was fired by the full expression of their rights and their responsibilities to break the chains and shake away the weight of colonial imposed control. You see, regardless of your specific First Nations Crown relationship, pre-Confederation, numbered treaties, 
modern treaty and other agreements, we are all pursuing a way forward that's based on our rights and our responsibilities. And it's very clear to me, and it's what the elders are always reminding us, that we must work together and support one another. We know, of course, very well that there are challenges, problems and even crises back home. Emergencies like flood flooding and fires cause tremendous devastation to our communities and families that are already struggling. I visited First Nations struggling with difficult circumstances time and time again this last year. I was in Peguis First Nations. They, like many, have had flooding over and over again, and for them it meant evacuating families six times in the last three years. This is completely unacceptable. I also witnessed firsthand the trauma of our people dealing with the devastation of missing and murdered women and girls. There is no more important need than safety and security. We cannot make progress if we cannot assure the safety of our children. I spoke at a women's summit last month, and I was heartbroken, as many were, when we think of the little boys and girls who would not grow up with a mom, who would not grow up knowing the love that every single child deserves. And here I want to take a moment to reflect on that which the Premier raised briefly. We've seen the tragic news late yesterday from Samson Cree, First Nation. And I know that we all extend our deep sympathy to all of the people and families at Hobima. This tragic loss of a young boy, only five years old, taken from his family, taken from his future, he was taken by senseless violence. I know that we all feel the pain very deeply and all extend our prayers to everyone affected. We will be addressing this a bit later with the support and guidance of the elders as we have asked that a book of condolences be created for all of us to reflect our thoughts and our feelings and join in solidarity with those that are hurting right now, those that are really suffering. We have reached out to the family and the leadership who accept our prayers and who also share that they really feel that this is the most horrific terrible setback for a community that feels like it has been making progress to deal with violence. The news, as the Premier said, offers up a very stark reminder of our responsibility. This kind of tragic news brings heightened focus to the work that we've gathered here to do over the next three days. It reminds us that our job is to build healthier, stronger and safer communities for our people. Communities that are free of gangs and crime and senseless violence like this. Absolutely, these are also, as was referenced, symptoms of poverty, despair and hopelessness. We also knew in our hearts that there is much more that we have to do. We have to demonstrate the leadership and show the courage that's needed to say no more. To say that no matter what, we will protect our children and our families. And no matter what, that we will support one another. We need to foster understanding and connections within and among our First Nations to end the violence. This is our call. Our call to be there for our kids, to love and honor the memory of all those tragically lost and stand firm in our conviction to achieve a day when this violence is no more. This is our task together creating the conditions for comfort, confidence, caring and security so they don't have to shed tears for the most vulnerable of our citizens. This reality is becoming clear to more Canadians. The Auditor General released her final report a few weeks ago, and the report states that Canada has no guide, no clear targets or outcomes for its work with First Nations. Canada has no strategy or ability to measure results for our communities. And the report, of course, is no surprise to us as First Nations. We live this reality every single day. It is near impossible, Chiefs, you share this time and time again, to make plans for the long term when there is no certainty in resources, 
and extremely difficult to build our economies when it's mired in restrictions and outdated policies. And even we have the department changing its name, arbitrarily becoming Aboriginal Affairs. And our communities are left asking, what does this mean? What's going to be the impact? The results of a unilateral approach are as predictable as they are tragic. The Auditor General says that over the years, things have gotten worse and the gap in the quality of life is widening. She looked at the cold, hard facts and found that our people and children are suffering. The way forward, according to the Auditor General, requires a dramatic shift. The unilateralism of the past has simply not worked and that the federal government and First Nations must now work together to overcome current conditions and chart a better future for all First Nations citizens. As you know, the Assembly of First Nations and the federal government set out the Canada First Nations Joint Action Plan. This in response to the priorities established by First Nations leaders. Canada has signaled its commitment to work with us in key areas, making a direct link to the apology and to the endorsement of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This plan is guided by key principles that recognize and affirm Aboriginal and treaty rights, and this is the foundation. We have been calling consistently for real engagement and real partnership to advance our priorities. This means free, prior, and informed consent when it comes to any decisions that might affect First Nations rights or jurisdictions. The plan is about working together to strengthen the, the Crown First Nations relationship with assurances that it will not affect any local or regional processes. It identifies advancing the implementation of treaty rights, improving negotiation and implementation, and reviewing the comprehensive claims policy as priorities for action. It also expresses support from Canada on the priorities of education, the economy and capacity building for First Nations governments. And so make no mistake, this work is not new. As leaders, many of you, many of us have spent years, decades, working towards improving the lives of our people. This plan is a focused agenda on some key priorities and we will, of course, still need to move on other areas that are important to our people. First Nations governments are ready to exercise our rights and our responsibilities. Working in partnership and in mutual respect was the original vision of our ancestors and that vision can guide us forward. For decades now, our treaty nations have watched as resources drain from the north to the south with no benefit to our communities. We've watched as our rivers are harvested without our consent to power the bright lights in big cities, as our burial grounds are flooded and our people are relegated to slop buckets. Now is the time for Canadians to learn the truth about our peoples, about our treaties, about our nation-to-nation -nation relationships so that we can move forward together in partnership. That was always the vision. At every step of the way, all of us, whether at the community level, treaty or regional organization, or at the national office, we all have a role to play. The Assembly of First Nations National Strategy on Treaties advances key elements and supports every treaty nation in their work. This was the premise of our first ever International Indigenous Energy and Mining Summit just a few weeks ago, a very successful event that we hosted with the National Congress of American Indians that involved over 800 Indigenous leaders and citizens. Some suggest that there is either an economic agenda or a rights agenda. But let me be clear, there is only one agenda, and it is our rights agenda. This is the only path that respects our past and reflects our responsibilities to the future. As stewards of the land, First Nations have been balancing development and the environment for generations, and we heard Chief Knockwood's plea about the river, and we must support him. This shows that we are still leading the way today. Our conversation with Canada will continue until we eventually find ourselves with a willing Crown partner to implement all elements of treaty. This conversation continues through our assembly here. Our agenda is designed for specific strategy discussions on all of the major issues affecting us, from education to health, community safety, environment, residential schools, lands, child welfare and governance. 
we will not be pushed back where our rights are concerned. We can, must, and will stand strong and play offense on our rights. Our time together here is critical to discuss our work and set out strategies to maximize support and success. This is serious business. I am open to a joint approach agreed to by the federal government, but it's our responsibility to hold the government to account because our objectives are action and outcomes. This is why we called for a First Nations Crown Gathering to be held later this year. This gathering would be a meeting between First Nations leaders and the Prime Minister and key federal government representatives. We're calling for a focused agenda so that we emerge with a focused plan of action. We do not want a pan-Aboriginal approach and we don't want a lot of talk because now is the time to act. These efforts must culminate in critical investments. We know the needs at the community level. Our children cannot wait. There are priorities that we can and must act on now because we simply cannot afford, afford to lose another generation. We are engaging all jurisdictions to generate a critical mass of support for results. And as the Premier mentioned, we'll be meeting with the Premiers and the Council of Federation in a, in a meeting coming up this month. We have a major funding challenge, and we are demanding that the inequity be addressed. We are calling for stable, sustainable funding that is at very minimum equal to the guarantees enjoyed by the provinces. And as a priority, we need an education system that fully supports our kids. The Prime Minister told me that he supports this priority, that he'll work with us. The National Panel on Education is underway with its first visits. They were in Akwesasne. They had their first key meeting last week with the AFN Chiefs Committee on Education. And right after that, they met with the First Nations Education Steering Committee in BC. They're building their full schedule and will ensure that every region has the opportunity to engage in this process. But I want to be very clear. Every First Nations choice to engage or not will be fully respected. I know some First Nations prefer a parallel process. Still others are focused on actions through the courts or through parliamentary and other efforts. And others yet are taking to the streets. Well, we support and we need every effort. The work of the panel is to listen to you, to develop options and produce a report that will go to the minister and to First Nations at the same time. And you have my full commitment that these options will come to every one of you for discussion. The next steps will be as a result of our collective deliberations and direction because in advance there is no deal, there is no agreed upon outcome. This is about advancing your direction, getting the federal government to the table and working to deliver the results for our children. Ultimately, the path forward is up to you and each and every community. My role, as I've said time and time again, is to open doors or kick them down if I have to. And we can, if we stand strong together, stand against fear-mongering and division by our critics and those who try to fight our agenda by trying to get us to fight one another. These old tactics have been used against us and have also been used within us. We cannot fight for our rights if we're fighting one another. But what we can do is we can stand tall together and lead. We must lead now for our rights, for our responsibilities, and especially for the kids. We owe it to our people to seize every opportunity and turn it to our advantage. We absolutely do not go into initiatives like the National Panel or the Joint Action Plan with blinders on. We go in fully aware of the challenges. Our elders and ancestors achieved great victories because of their strategy and insight, and we can do the same here. We will never compromise our rights, our principles, or our people for the sake of an agreement. We do owe it to those same people to seize every opportunity to make their lives better. It may be that we're successful only in one area, and if so, well, that's success. And if we're smart and strategic, and most of all, if we are united, we can achieve great success. But we must do our very best. 
We owe it to our children and those yet to come. We have the protections that we need, the armor and shields that protect us as we advance forward, armed with the victories of our ancestors and the ceremonies they left us, with Section 35 of the Constitution, with the apology and commitment to reconciliation, and now the global endorsement of the United Nations Declaration. These protect us, support us in our ongoing struggle. But there is no question about it, that this is also about vigilance every step of the way. We must ass assess the report that comes and we must also be fully satisfied. On every element, we must put a stake in the ground, a stake that compels action on our terms. This is our work together. Chiefs have clearly instructed us to make the UN Declaration a guide to our advocacy and our efforts, to take forward the approach that compels mutual respect and partnership and sets clear standards to achieve in everything that we do. That is where I see the role of the Assembly of First Nations and us as an executive, helping to create the space for nations to advance their strategies and jurisdictions in accordance with their rights and responsibilities and reminding ourselves the Assembly of First Nations is not a party to treaty. We do not hold Aboriginal title and rights. That is the responsibility of First Nations governments. And so today, I want to begin concluding by sharing with you a paper that expands on my remarks here. It reflects what we've heard from First Nations leaders, what you've been saying to me and to us very directly, and about the challenges that are before us. What I hope emerges is a very clear picture. It is a vast amount of varied activity from coast to coast to coast, all very much built on a firm foundation of our rights. It's a dedicated effort to rebuild and reclaim our jurisdiction and our responsibilities that all of us are involved in. It is, though, a journey, while it's varied, it's a journey with a very clear destination. This destination is one that affirms our rightful place in our lands, in our territories. It's one that cherishes our children and, importantly, creates a better future for them. I invite you all to take a look. This is in your kits this morning, and it can also be found on our website. It reflects back on the work that we're all engaged in, in a way to help us to consider our efforts and our next steps. There are four key elements that I wanted to reflect back in this brief paper. First is the First Nations Crown relationship, which I spoke of. Two is the need for new fiscal relationships, which I hear over and over again from First Nations governments. Three is the implementation of our First Nations governments. And four is the structural change required because the bureaucrat, bureaucratic like machinery of government has simply miserably failed us. Each element has possible paths and activities that we're pursuing. Each element must be advanced in balance with the others to achieve our goal. Advancing the first area, the First Nations Crown relationship, means progress through steps like the First Nations Crown gathering. First Minister's meetings with First Nations and potential First Nation Crown Agreement that advances and affirms our rights. And so we have a lot of work to do. Our organizations must be aligned to support and enable nation rebuilding and the successful development of governing institutions with clear accountability, accountability reporting and direction. When I stood before you a year ago, this time last year, and said that we can envision a time in the next two to five years when our governments, at their choice and based on their direction, can operate outside the narrow barriers of the Indian Act. Over the past year, I've traveled to every region and many, many communities, and I can say to you, the leaders here, my friends and fellow leaders, this is entirely possible. In fact, it's actually already well underway. Our work is to continue to drive forward and find the ways that we can fully support one another. By looking at this journey and by assessing each element and each of our respective responsibilities, we can organize our efforts, we can mobilize our energies, and we can inspire not only our own people, but others right across this country to join us and to support us. We're starting to see this happen. Whether it's at the boards of trades where I've been invited, the large gatherings of Canada's business and opinion leaders, 
that I've had the opportunity to speak with, the annual meetings of groups like the United Way, of academics and institutions. We've advanced statements of partnership with many groups and we see increasing advocacy throughout the mainstream. Leaders and ordinary Canadians saying, is enough is enough, we get it. And I met a man who traveled all the way from Toronto just to come here to, to let us know that he supports us and that people support us. They're saying that we do have to do something. Yes, of course, we have a lot of work to do. But I feel that we're approaching a critical mass of public support to turn the tide, to push the tipping point. I believe strongly, as you've heard others say, that this is our time. It's our time as well to push harder because of news the likes of which we've heard this morning. Yes, let's have and we need to make sure we engage in the challenging conversations to deal with each other openly and honestly. It's our time to come together to support one another. I really truly believe that this is our time as Indigenous nations. We are not and we will not back away from the fight for our rights and the fight especially for our children. I can guarantee you we will continue until we have achieved the fairness and the justice that our children rightly and richly deserve. We are not backing away from the fight for our rights. So together, let's do our work to honour that young boy from Samson Cree, and indeed every child, to honour all our people, let them know that we can and that we must make a better tomorrow and that we must do this together. Our citizens, we know, must come first. It's something that I hear at home in a house it when the chiefs are being talked to by the people, a chief, you are nothing without your people, they remind the chiefs back home. So our work can't simply be about press releases or playing politics, plain and simple. We must agree that we will no longer accept the tragedies we see every single day in our communities. And after all, this is indeed actually life or death. This is about all of us collectively lifting up our citizens, our brothers and our sisters, our mothers and our fathers, our grandparents, but most importantly, that which we speak of, our children and our grandchildren. So I want to thank you, Sewi Lalin, for joining me and the entire assembly today. I look forward to the days ahead, to our reflections and deliberations, to set the course forward together. Tleko, tleko. Thank you very much.